just your normal place. You're Amy's in her normal place. place. Well, you're like one chair over, don't you normally sit? <laughs> he usually sits here. He usually, that's what's messed up, okay. It's yeah. raw, that's what it is. Yep. <laughs> All right, good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, good to be with y'all this evening for uh, Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, we are continuing our study in the book of Exodus. So if you can uh, get to get to the book of Exodus, it's actually the second book in the Bible. Just, there you go. All right. And um, as we're getting started tonight, uh, let's, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Okay, let's pray. Uh, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. And Lord, I thank you that uh, there are people who, uh, even on a gorgeous day like today, would, uh, would come out and... Uh, sit together and gaze at the, at the true beauties of your word together and consider uh, holy and heavenly things. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are with us uh, in every stage of life. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that your word is good and true and so full of mysteries and so full of uh, goodness. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would fill us tonight with your spirit, that you would uh, build us up in the faith, and that you would show us wonderful things in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we started looking at the, well, we continued to look at really the uh, Mosaic Covenant, and we uh, focused on the fact that the, uh, the covenant was uh, instituted, the Mosaic Covenant was instituted with the people, and, and I, I mentioned four distinct parts of, of the institution of the covenant. So if you remember, um, the terms of the covenant were read, so, so Moses read the terms of the covenant, we remember that, and then the people said, what did they say? Asher? All that God has commanded, we will do. Very good, son. Yeah, all that God has commanded, we will do. Uh, then the covenant was ratified by blood. So there was a, there was a sacrifice of, of uh, the, the animals. And uh, then the elders and Moses and Nadab and Abihu, who were, and Aaron, who were Nadab and Abihu? Aaron's sons, good. They ate a covenant meal with the God of Israel. So uh, we, we pointed out that this is very similar to, uh, to what? Yeah, communion and the Lord's Supper. Um, in general, it's very similar to the to the covenant that, um, or to the way that we enter into into covenant with God. Um, we the the terms of the covenant are are declared to us. Uh, what what do you have to do in order to uh, be in covenant with God? Somebody tell me. You want to be in covenant with God? What do you have to do? Repent and believe. Repent and believe, Repent and believe what? Christ is. Word and in him. Yeah, okay, so you have to repent of your sins and believe the gospel, and the gospel is that Christ came and lived the perfect life in our place, and he died in our place, um, and, and it is his blood that brings us into communion with God. So the covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ on the cross. And then we, we also have a covenant meal that we celebrate every uh, Sunday. We celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is our covenant meal. So Jesus, and you know, we talked about all this last week, that Jesus is the, uh, the Lamb of God, right, that was slain for the sins of the world. Um, the, when, when Moses, we talked about something else. Moses takes the blood uh, of, the, of the covenant and he, he does something with it. He, he divides the blood into, and he puts it on two distinct uh what can I say without giving away the answer? What does Moses do with the blood? <laughs> Bobby, what's he do? Flashes it on the wall and on the people. Yeah, he throws it up against the altar, uh, half of it, and half of it he throws it upon the people. And, and he says, uh, does anybody remember what he says? Y'all are doing great, by the way. Anybody remember what Moses says when he throws the blood on the people? Yeah, Asher? He says something about a covenant. I yeah, he says, this is the blood of the covenant that God is making with you. And, uh, and, and that's a phrase that somebody else uses. Yeah? Jesus, Jesus uses that phrase when he says, um, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So you can see a lot of overlap and parallels, um, a lot of foreshadowing in the literal sacrifices um, towards the true sacrifice of Jesus Christ. A lot of foreshadowing from that covenant meal to the to what that meal pointed to, which is the Lord's Supper, and that, and even the Lord's Supper is is pointing towards something else, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
But God never changes. He, he enters into covenant with people in the same way um, that he did back then. Uh, we, we also um, <clears throat> talked about, uh, we, well, we started to talk about the tabernacle. And um, remember, while from chapters 25 to 31 of Exodus, uh, Moses is not with the people. Where, where is Moses? Yeah, he's up on the mountain. He's up on Mount Sinai. And he is receiving instructions about uh, the building of the tabernacle, especially, and also um, a little bit about uh, the, the uh, civil and ceremonial laws, which we, we looked at a couple weeks ago. So he's up, on, he's up on the mountain. God is speaking to him, bless you, um, in the cloud on, on the top of Mount Sinai. And the people are down below. And we'll get to the people maybe this week. We'll see. Uh, but but um, so we're in, in uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's, let's read Exodus 25, verse 9. Who's got, who will read Exodus 25, 9? Yeah, Heather, go ahead. According to all that I showed you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you show me again. Okay, and then uh, read 25.40 as well. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Okay, and then uh, let me read uh, Hebrews 8, verse 5. You know, the Old and New Testament complement each other. Uh, so you can't really understand the old without the new or the new without the old. It's pretty cool. Uh, but in Hebrews 8, 5, it says that, um, that all these things, all these things that we're about to look at in the tabernacle, it says they serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tabernacle, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. So does everybody, everybody hear that? So that, those are the verses that Heather just read in Exodus. And the author of the Hebrews Paul, says that, uh, that, that you know, he quotes this. And he says that Moses made everything that he made according to the pattern that was shown to him. So Moses is on the mountain and God is showing him something up here. And he says, now make these things down here like what you saw on the mountain. Okay. So what God showed Moses came first. This is why I wish Ben was here. Because this is kind of like the platonic forms, but not exactly. Uh, but what Moses was shown was first. It happened before the literal tabernacle, right? But the literal things point to the heavenly things. They're patterns. Uh, this was the pattern, actually. This is the, the, the constructing of the tabernacle according to the pattern. But all of these things that we're going to look at point upwards towards that which is true. They point forwards to Christ. Ross? So is this supposed to be like a literal interpretation of like God's throne room or something, or is this like all symbolic of something else? Uh, yes and no. It's 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 uh, it is God's throne room and God's presence, um, and we're actually going to spend some time tonight looking at what all this stuff pointed to. So um, so yes, yes, I would say yes and um, more than God, than God's throne room, um, but. But exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so the first thing that Moses does, just to kind of take you through these chapters rather quickly, the first thing that Moses does, or the first thing that God does, is he tells Moses to take a free will offering from the people. And, uh, and this is in chapter 25, verses 1 through 8, which we're not going to read right now. But we did point out at the end of last week's lesson that where would the people get anything to give to God? From the Egyptians, and God uh, gave the Egyptians uh, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and they freely the Egyptians freely gave them uh, gold and jewelry as they were heading out from Egypt. <coughs> so, so they then turn and and are going to take an offering. Uh, you know, Moses is going to take an offering from what the Egyptians gave them. God moved the Egyptians to give to the people. Okay. Um, <coughs> Let's, uh, let's read Revelation 11, 19. Uh, who will read that? Revelation 11, 19. <coughs> Amy, go ahead. Sorry, my sinuses have been messed up. <clears throat> Allergies and stuff. And then uh, Revelation 3, 12. Who will read that? Okay, Adeline. Okay, go ahead, Amy. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. 
There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Okay, so we see that we see just like Ross asked a minute ago, is this pointing towards uh, the throne room of God in heaven? And uh, the answer is yes. And we're going to see some, we're going to see a lot of overlap. Uh, what about Revelation three twelve? Okay, so this is highly um, symbolic language. Uh, the one who conquers, so this is that, that phrase in Greek that Jesus uses uh, all through chapters 2 and 3. Um, it's ha nikon, so nikon is where we get the, uh, it's a Greek word uh, for, for victory. Uh, uh, Nike, uh, it's where Nike gets its name, right? So Nike just means victory, it's a Greek word. Uh, but the one who is conquering, or the one who conquers, Jesus says, um, that's, the, that's the phrase that he uses, and after it, he, he gives all kinds of promises. You know, he'll give you some of the hidden manna to eat. He will give you a stone on which is a new name that only, you, that only he knows. And um, he will ultimately allow you to sit on his throne with him, just as he conquered and sat down on his, on his father's throne. So that's the huge promises that Jesus makes, uh, pr uh, um, and the prefix all of them is the one who conquers. Well, in this one, he says that he'll make uh, the one who conquers a pillar in the temple of his God. Now, does that mean that we're literally going to be a, a pillar? Like a, like we're going to turn into stone or something and just stand there for all eternity? No, but what, what does it mean? What do you think it means? Oh, I want to hear what Asher thinks real quick, just, just out of curiosity, because I, I, I just want to see what he thinks. It's like we, it's like we hold together the body of Jesus in a way, like the church, because if we, if we witness to each other and... Well, maybe, maybe. I mean, yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's an interesting thought. Uh, what do you think, Amy? Well, pillars hold things up, mm -hmm. they're stabilizers. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they don't move. They're, so, so the idea is that um, you're going to be, you're never going to leave the presence of God. You're never going to leave the presence of God. You're going to be um, in the presence of God for all eternity. Um, you'll never be sent away. Um, you'll be um, steadfast and fixed. It doesn't mean that you won't be going around on the new earth doing things and uh, working and having fun, but you'll always be in the presence of God as well, the immediate presence of God. Isn't that the same as... Uh, uh Joshua and all of these people that went out for years mm. and, and gave the uh, uh, spreading the good news, mm. you could say. Constantly. Yes. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a book I read, I told you about the Pillars of Stone, mm -hmm. and all the time I thought it was about Concrete's Post. Because that was on the front of the book until I got into the book and realized it was, it was 300 years of the same generations of people kin to one another. Yes, yeah, so all during the, all of the, all of the, the, the Christian war. Yeah, so all the saints who have gone before us um, that, that are true believers have conquered and they would be the recipients of this promise as well for sure. Um, okay, now <clears throat> the temple furnishing. So let's talk about the let's talk about the tabernacle for a minute. The tab I keep saying the temple, but the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a movable tent, so it was a, it was a movable sanctuary um, that the people would um, be able to carry with them as they wandered in the desert. And um, <clears throat> and so the tabernacle. These are the dimensions of the tabernacle. I've tried my best to draw it, as, you know, fairly close to scale, but it's not perfect. Um, but it was uh, 150 feet long by 75 feet. This, this is the outer courtyard by 75 feet this way. Um, these the walls were uh, were basically um, uh, uh, tethered down to the ground by pegs uh, and. They were, I think, about seven feet high. The wall was about seven feet high going all around. 
here. Um, there was a there was a curtain of blue and scarlet cloth that uh, was about 30 feet wide, or was 30 feet wide, that, that was the only entrance into the courtyard, okay? The actual tabernacle itself was 45 feet long by 15 feet um, wide, and it had, a, it had a 15, so it had a 15 foot curtain here whereby you would enter. Um, this would be the altar of sacrifice. So as soon as you came into the courtyard, there would be the altar of sacrifice where the burnt offerings were offered. Then you'd have what's called the brazen laver or, uh, or the, uh, the, the pool, okay, um, where the priest would wash. Going into the tabernacle, you've got the, the holy place and the most holy place. Inside the holy place, you've got the table of showbread, the menorah, which we'll talk about in just a minute, that's just, menorah is a literal uh, uh, Hebrew word. It actually sounds like, um, when you say menorah, it sounds like the Hebrew for what this is. And then uh, the altar of incense. And inside the most holy place was what? The Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, right. Okay, so that was, that, that, those were the only temple furnishings um, that, were, that were there, and we're going we're gonna to talk about them. Uh, but again, there were these three divisions. There was the courtyard, there was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place. Okay, uh, let's talk about the Ark for just a minute. So the Ark of the Covenant um, was uh, constructed in order to contain what? What was supposed to go inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, exactly. Uh, so the Ten Commandments were... You know, written by the by the finger of God, uh, as it were. So God actually carved the stone tap on the stone tablets the law uh, of the Ten Commandments. So uh, very very special, obviously. And 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 the Ark was constructed to hold this, to hold these Ten Commandments. Um, <clears throat> there was also so let's look at uh, uh, Exodus twenty five fifty two just for a minute. Or I'm sorry. Exodus 24, 12. Sorry. I don't know what that reference is. Somebody must have messed me up there. Okay. Uh, so, so on 24, 12 it says, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction." Uh, so, so there you go. So um, there were also two other objects that were put in the ark. Does anybody know what they are without looking at your notes? Yeah. Okay, yeah, a lot of people knew. Okay, very good. Yeah, so the, so the, the rod, so Aaron's rod, and uh, some of the manna, okay? Uh, let's see, who will read Hebrews 9 for? Okay, Cindy? Hebrews 9 4. Can't see the little four. Okay, here it is. Which had the golden altar in which had the golden altar of incense and the gold covered ark of the covenant. The ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, the ark, what can y'all tell me about the ark? What did the ark look like? It was gold. Okay, yeah, very good. Yes, Asher? It had four rings on the bottom of it. Yes. Which were to hold. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Okay, what else? What's that? Whatever's in the movie, Indiana Jones. Yeah. That you want to say, too. Yeah. Yeah, Indiana Jones. Uh, <laughs> Not the best theologian, but good movies. I like the movies. Yeah. 
except the last one. The last one was horrible. Yeah. What was it, the Crystal Skulls or whatever that thing was? It was just terrible, terrible movie. But anyway. Uh, all right. Anyway, he named the dog Indiana, so that's the main thing to remember. Okay, um, so... But uh, but no, in all seriousness, what what was uh, actually actually Indiana Jones uh, did depict this part of the ark that I'm thinking of. What was on top of the ark? There's a lid, yes, a mercy seat or, or a lid, and there were cherubim. Okay, there there were two carved cherubim that were on top of the ark, and you can see a perfect depiction of of them right here on my ark drawing. Um, and you know, if you just you know, maybe too far away, but I assure you, it's intricate detail, and uh, and just a uh, really, really good drawing. So, but yeah, on top of on top of the ark, there were two cherubim, and their faces are turned downward towards uh, the towards the the ark. Now, wh why do you think their faces are turned downwards towards the ark? Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. And also, what's inside the ark again? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. And so, the the focus of the cherubim is is symbolically upon the Word of God. It is upon God's Word. Um, and so, it says that God, excuse me, the presence of God would meet uh, with Moses from a, from on top of the mercy seat. Um, and, uh, and, and here it is in, in Exodus 25, 21. It says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. That's the Ten Commandments. And then verse 22, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on, on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in the commandment for the people of Israel. So if you think about it, God, God's localized presence would meet with Moses uh, in between and, a, and slightly above the outstretched wings of the cherubim. The cherubim's faces are turned down. Now that's very much like what we see in uh, the book of Revelation where the angels, uh, the, the six-winged uh, seraphim are hiding their face right from the Lord because they're not going to look at him. And so, so it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of symbology and, um, and, and very intentional uh, directions that God gives, even for the construction of the ark. It wasn't like Moses just slapped a couple of angels up there. Um, everything about the ark is very detailed. Everything about the, the whole tabernacle is very detailed and very intentional. And, um, and, and there's a visual depiction of spiritual truths. We look, and the angels look towards the word, but they will not turn their faces up um, to look at God and to look at the presence of God. Now, God is, uh, this, this is something we can talk about. God is omnipresent. He is, he is everywhere present. You know, as David says, where can I flee from your presence, right? Um, so, the, so the presence of God is everywhere, but there is a special presence of God where God manifests himself and makes his presence known. And we've seen that all through our studies already. What, what are some ways that God localized his presence and made his presence known? The pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Very good. Yes. Yes, sir? In Genesis, there was the, the three men. Yes, the three men in Genesis 18. So God appears to Abraham. Now, that's interesting because in those types of, um, of um, theophanies, uh, sometimes the glory of God was not, the glory of God was concealed. Um, there's a time in, in the book of Judges that I'm quite fond of where um, the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah who, and his wife, so Samson's parents, and uh, he doesn't reveal himself until the very end. He doesn't reveal that you know, he is glorious until, until the very end. So we see that God can conceal his presence. <laughs> And, uh, but but there, there are times when God uh, does appear in a, in a localized way, so, so the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, uh, the burning bush, right? Uh, the, the fireworks on top of Mount Sinai where the, the mountain smoked and was wreathed in, uh, in fire and, um, and, and other, other times when God would appear. Uh, the Shekinah glory is what we're talking about when we're talking about God appearing uh, on top of the mercy seat. 
Um, and th this, is, uh, this is what happens uh, when God would meet with Moses or Aaron and later with the high priest of Israel. Okay, now um, <clears throat> we talked about this. We talked about this briefly uh, last week, but the ark was never to be touched with human hands. Uh, once it was constructed, it was never to be touched with human hands, but instead it was to be carried at all times uh, with poles by the priests. And so let's look at uh, Exodus 24, 25, 14. And somebody read that for me. Walt, do you have that, brother? 25, 14. Yep. And actually, uh, start in verse 12. 12 through 15. 12 through 15. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark and carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put the ark here. Put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. Okay. Now, uh, tell me, because we've talked about this recently, somebody tell me uh, why, what happened when, when David was bringing the ark back from the Philistines and uh, Uzzah was struck dead. What happened and why did that happen? Somebody besides Asher. Appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, Ross? Oh. Go, go ahead, Gigi. It's, it's fine. They were not transporting the ark as God had told them to. They had it in a buggy. That's right. Yeah, they had it on, in a new ox cart. Okay, so it was, you know, it was a brand new, you know, 2022 model uh, okay. ox cart, you know, just right off the lot. And they thought that that would be really good, you know, to carry the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. Because after all, the Philistines took the Ark... Um, you know, they, the Philistines actually sent the ark back to Israel on an ox cart. So the people learned, the Israelites learned from the Philistines that this is a better way to carry the ox cart, right? Why, why do we need these poles and so forth? Yes, Ava? Do you have something? The understanding that she said because they were carrying it on an ox cart and one other who touched it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so nobody was to touch the ark. That's right. Um, and so, so now if you if you just if you read the account of this is very important if I can articulate it, but if you if you read the account of uh, David um, and and and, his, and the company bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, back to, to Jerusalem, and uh, and and the oxen stumbling and the ox cart starting to fall and the ark starting to fall and uh, Uzzah reaching out to steady it, the details about the poles are not there. There's no commentary there about uh, this is why the Lord did it. Okay, there's no commentary about that. Um, you have to know the directions that God gave and put together why. Okay, but I've actually heard people preach and teach, and maybe you have too, uh, and just be really bewildered about why would God do this? Why would God strike somebody down when they're just trying to help when they have good intentions? And that shows actually a profound, and I don't mean this in, a bad, in, in an insulting way, but it shows a profound ignorance of who the Lord is and how he is. He expects his people to know his word, and he expects them to diligently obey it. Um, they said, all that the Lord commands we will do. And, and once you say that, um, you're required to know what the Lord commands and, and do your diligence to study uh, what he expects. And that's true today as well. But all the directions are there. But now let's um, let's look at another. Let's look at what David did later. So David actually David actually um, gets angry at God, right? When he strikes Uzzah dead, he get, David gets angry, and the Bible says that he's that he's angry, and he just sends it away to a man named Obed Edom. Uh, sends it away to his house for three three months. That's a great name, by the way, Obed Edom. Uh, I love the names. So uh, so he so he sends it away, and then. And then what happens to, to Obed-Edom? It's very interesting. I was listening to the Bible being read while I was mowing the lawn this week, and, uh, and this was part of, the, part of what I was listening to again. But what, what happens? Does, what does God do? He blesses Obed-Edom. He blesses Obed-Edom in his house. 
And so somebody comes to David and says, you know, the Lord's blessing Obed-Edom's house uh, because the ark is there. And so what, is, what did David do? He, he kind of threw a fit, didn't he? He kind of threw a fit. He didn't like what God did. And he said, and, and so he said, fine, I'm just not taking the ark back to, back to Jerusalem. It's like, I'll show you, God. You know, you're not going to deal kindly with me. You're going you're to strike somebody dead when they're just trying to help. And so, fine. But did that, did that benefit David? No, it didn't benefit David at all. Did it, did it, do you think it, um, you know, was any, do you think the Lord was like up there wringing his hands, like thinking, you know, oh man, you know, I, uh, I've struck somebody dead and David's upset. No. See, when we get angry at the Lord, it doesn't benefit us at all. Uh, but we do mess out, miss out on a blessing. So David, and, 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 you know, God doesn't change because we're not happy with the way he's doing something. It's, it's really foolish to act like that, you know. If the Lord does something that we don't like, ours is to try to understand why, but it doesn't do any good uh, while worshiping him and while, you know, while confessing that he's good. Um, but uh, it's curious because it's like David didn't remember the details about how the ark was to be carried. Well, in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, uh, this is what it says, okay? So David... Uh, David summoned the priest Zadok and Abiathar and the Levites and so forth, and he said, uh, he said, um, consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I prepared for it. And then here it is, because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not seek him according to the rule. You hear that? So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So you see, you see in 1 Chronicles, we see why. Why was it a struck dead? Why did the Lord break out against them? It was because they were treating him like a common uh, thing. They, they weren't reverencing the Lord uh, as they were handling the things of the Lord. And that angered God. Um, and rightly so. He is holy, and he will be considered holy by the people. Um, okay. Now, by the way, that's the, that, that is the account, if you've ever, uh, if you remember, David begins to dance before the ark of the Lord. Um, after, six, after six or seven steps, I can't remember which, I think it's six steps, the priest uh, sacrificed the Lord as soon as they started carrying the ark. Um, and David is dancing before the Lord. And then his wife, uh, which, which wife was it? Michael, yep. So Michael, his wife, makes fun of him and says that he's just being, you know, unrefined before the Lord. And what and David says, uh, he says, I was dancing before the Lord, and he says, I will be uh, more abased still, as it were. So he's like, you know, I'm going to dance, I'm going to worship the Lord even harder, uh, even even more intensely than before. And uh, and so so that's that is a, a big principle too. When you're not in congregated worship, when there's not a solemn assembly going on. Um, you know, there's a different kind of way to worship the Lord. And you should be like a little child before him. And uh, really, you don't have to be refined to worship God, right? Okay, uh, let's see. The poles were where? Where were the poles on the, on the ark? The bottom of the ark, and why? Why was that? Because when they carry it on their shoulders, where is the ark? Above their heads, Above their heads right. And, and isn't it right that God would be above the people? Okay, but if it's on an ox cart, different effect, right? Now their heads are above where the presence of God would meet with the high priest. Okay, uh, all right, enough about, enough about the ark there, except for the fact that it was the only piece of furniture there. Um, in the holy place, there were three pieces of, of uh, temple furniture that we want to talk about, or tabernacle, tabernacle furniture that we want to talk about. There was the, uh, the bread of the presence, and this was the, sh the table that sometimes it's called the table of showbread. Um, in Hebrew, and my Hebrew is not great, okay? Um, you know, I can get around with language tools. My Greek is much better than my Hebrew, but, um, but it's a very hard phrase to translate. Um, it's literally the face-to-my-face face bread. That's, that's how it is in Hebrew. It's the face-to-my-face face bread, or the bread that faces my face. That's, that's, the, that's what this bread is called. And, and again, it's a very um, weird phrase, but there's a, there's a phrase that's almost identical in Exodus 33, 11, where it says that God used to speak to Moses face-to-face -face 
as a man speaks to his friend. So this idea of the showbread um, being in the presence of God is a very important, it's a very important idea. It's a very important uh, truth that God was teaching us. How many pieces of bread were there? Does anybody remember? Twelve. And why were there twelve? One, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. So what so what's the spiritual truth that's being uh, being pointed to here? So if I don't call on you, don't speak, okay? Because Miss Cindy was speaking, you just interrupted again, okay? And I know she doesn't mind, but I do. Yeah. All right, yeah. So the um, so say that again, Cindy. Um, that the Lord communes with the twelve tribes of Israel. Exactly. That's right. So the Lord is the Lord wants His people in His presence, uh, and and He He wants to be uh, He wants the people to commune with Him and to be in His presence. Um, there's there's a lot that we could say here, um, but yes, the twelve tri the, the twelve pieces of bread were representative of the of the people of Israel. Uh, let's look at First Corinthians ten seventeen because Keith was teaching about this uh, just this last Sunday. Now, who who is the true bread of life? Jesus, yeah, Jesus is. Um, and there's a big theme in the Gospels of Jesus being the true Israel. We're not going to really go there now, but just except just to hint at it. But let's look. Uh, who's got 1 Corinthians 10, 17? Keith, you got it? Go ahead. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Yeah, so we all partake of the one bread, and we are, we are one body. Um, and so, so there's this very clear um, symbology here that just as they were represented by the bread, um, so we are um, communing with God in the presence of God. So this is pointing to the fellowship uh, that we have before the Lord to meet with Him in His immediate presence face to face. Okay, there's also in the, um, in the holy place, there's also the golden lampstand. Now the golden lampstand, let me see how much time I've got. Yeah, i got time. Okay, so the golden lampstand uh, is called the menorah, and it was a seven-stemmed uh, lamp. It was a seven-stemmed lamp. Uh, and why, was, why do you think there were seven? Why do you think there were seven stems? Say that again. Yes, it's the number of perfection. Number of perfect, so, the, so seven is, is the number of perfection. And so there are there's seven. Now, now what, why is there seven? Why is it the number of perfection? What do you think it's representing? Anybody want to take a stab? <laughs> All right, so it's so it's so what we're gonna we're gonna look at some scriptures and then and then you'll know. Uh, but but let me just uh, give you a little a little uh, uh, preview here. It, it's representing the perfection of the light of God. It's representing the perfection of the light and truth of God. Um, let's look at, I'm going to call out some scriptures here. Let's see. Let's look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Who will read that? I'm going to call out several scriptures. Ava? Okay. Uh, Zechariah 3, 8 through 9. Who will read that? Zechariah 3, 8 through 9. Okay, Walt. Okay. Uh, Revelation 5, 6. Adeline? All right. And let's see, who else? Jenny, do you have your hand up? Okay, John chapter 8, verse 12. Okay. Gavin, can you read? Uh, John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Okay, and then uh, one more. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. One more reader. Okay, Bobby? All right. All right, so let's let's dig into this. Okay, so uh, so remember Moses said, make everything according to the to the pattern that is being shown to you on the mountain. So there are spiritual truths being revealed by the construction of the of these temple for, uh, furnishings. Let's look at Revelation four five. Who's got that one? Okay, go ahead, Abram, nice and loud. Okay, 
Okay, so isn't it interesting that just as there are seven lamps in the holy place, there are seven torches of fire burning before the presence of the Lord in heaven as John sees his throne, and they're identified as what? The seven spirits, the seven spirits of God. Okay, so remember that. All right, now uh, Zechariah 3, 8 through 9. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant, the branch. For behold, on the same stone, excuse me, for behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. All right, so just fascinating scripture. As you all know, Zechariah 3 is my favorite chapter in Zechariah. I, I don't know if you know that, but I say it a lot. I love Zechariah 3. I love the beginning of Zechariah 3 more than, than the portion that was read, but I love the portion that was read. So Joshua is the high priest, not Joshua of Moses, okay? Not, not Moses' assistant Joshua, but a later Joshua uh, who is the high priest. By the way, Jesus' uh, Jesus' Hebrew name is Joshua. That's, that's his name. He was named Joshua uh, because he would uh, deliver his people from their sins, just as the Joshua of Moses' day uh, brought the people into the uh, Holy Land. Okay, so so Joshua, the high priest here, um, is is being spoken to, and God uh, sets before him a or shows him a vision, as it were, of a stone with seven eyes, and this stone with seven eyes is going to uh, take away the sin of the people in a single day. Everybody hear what I said? Very important. The stone with seven eyes is symbolically pointing to the taking away of sin in a single day. Now, what does that remind you of? Christ on the cross. Christ on the cross. We are looking at a at, at a squirrel on a, on a surfboard or something over there. Right. No, seriously. So, so yes. So, and, and and also he talks about the branch. Now, who is the branch, and what is what is that all about? The branch. Yeah, it, it, Christ is the branch. Yes. Yeah, so, so you notice in your Bibles the word branch is capitalized, and that's because the branch is a title for Christ. Christ would be uh, a branch. Uh, from the root of Jesse. So he's, he's the, the descendant of David, right? And so, so, the, so the Davidic heir is going to take away sin in a single day, and that's the gospel. Gigi, you need a reference? No, Bobby needs help. <laughs> right. Well, I don't want Bobby to distract you here, so because I want you to hear this. All right, so, um, but, but now, so the, so the, the branch is... Going to, and, and the stone with seven eyes. Uh, now, now remember, and this is very important. And this, I know, this is a, there's, these are several connecting points. You've got the seven torches of God. You've got the seven lampstands. You've got the stone with seven eyes. And then let's look at Revelation five six. Who's got that? Adeline, read it nice and loud. Okay, so can you see the connection there? So the, the, the torches are called the seven spirits of God, but now there's a lamb with seven eyes that are the seven spirits of God. Remember, seven is the number of perfection, right? It's not like there are actually seven distinct spirits of God. This is a, this is a, a poetic description of the perfection of God's spirit. And you can see the lamb has the seven eyes showing that he has the fullness of the spirit of God. And, and the lamb is, of course... Jesus, right? So, so notice that the lamb has seven eyes. The stone that Zechariah has uh, sees has seven eyes. The branch and the stone are going to take away the sin of the people in a single day. So you can see all of this uh, prophetic um, vision that the prophets have. It's all pointing to the same truth of Jesus 
and, uh, and, and, and so we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a question, but I'm gonna keep, uh, keep going with this to, to sort of more flesh out what the, the menorah is. Go ahead, brother. Just a quick question. Is that stone with seven eyes any reference to um, the stone that the builders rejected? Yes, it is, absolutely. The stone that the builders rejected that has become the cornerstone, which is Christ. Yeah, so all of these symbols, you know, if you're just reading the Bible and you're just, you know, just sort of brushing through it and rushing through it and everything and sort of reading it while you're about to fall asleep or whatever, you're not going to see this stuff. But if you dig deep and you start looking at the cross references, my, one of my favorite things to do is go in these columns out to the side of the text and start looking up the connecting text. And even without commentary, Okay, just looking and seeing if I seeing if I can see the connections that the translators have have made, um, and then read commentaries and, and read good biblical commentaries, and you'll see wonderful things in the Word of God, uh, things that make your heart soar, uh, because this is a wonderful, wonderful book. It is the Word of God. It is more intricate than anything we have ever created. It is perfect and beautiful. You just have to know how to look and how to read. Okay, a couple more uh, verses that I've already called out. So John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. All right, now, now is, that, is that surprising now? Now that we know that the Lamb has seven eyes, that, that, uh, that the, uh, there's, a set, there's seven torches of, of fire in Revelation 4, seven eyes on the Lamb in Revelation 5, both identified as the seven spirits of God. A seven, uh, uh, seven uh, uh, stemmed lamp in the tabernacle that's pointing towards all of this that was shown to John on the mountain. You see? And now Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It shouldn't be a surprise to us at this point that Jesus describes himself as the light of the world. Um, this would be the only light in the holy place, by the way. This, was, this would be that which lights up the darkness and sheds light on all the rest of the truths, the spiritual truths uh, that belong to God. Yeah, uh, Ross and then Andy. So what would they do for light back in like the holy, holy areas back where the ark was? That's a great question. Does anybody want to answer that? I have an answer, but does anybody know what, where the light would come from here? The Lord of the Lord, I guess. The glory of the Lord. So yeah. like the whole thing like radiated or something and kind of glowed? Well, the glory of God would, the, the uh, visible glory of God would appear above the cherubim when he would meet with the priest. But yeah, yeah, no other light. Did you have something else, buddy, or is that what you were going to say? Good for you. All right, uh, where are we here? Let's see, somebody, Amy, yes. Yeah, um, Kathy and I went to Rome, and uh, we went to Italy in 2016, and we saw the ancient section of Rome and there was a, when the uh, when Jerusalem was uh, destroyed, when the temple was destroyed in seventy, um, they brought uh, they brought things back to Rome, the captives and a lot of articles, and they, they built a triumphal arch like they have in Paris. You've seen this is a smaller version, but it's a pretty big arch. I think Titus built it. Yep. And in the in the middle of that arch, I've got a picture of it right here. There's a menorah. Mm -hmm. There's, there are Romans carrying the menorah. And it's pretty interesting because that was that was built about um, eighty. Yep. So yeah, if anyone wants to see after the Bible study, you can take a look at it. That's pretty. But awesome. it gives you an idea of what it. I mean, I don't know how it exactly was. You know, it probably made it pretty close. Yep. Probably so. Yeah, the Arch of, of, of Titus. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see that picture, by the way. All right, and then one more: Matthew chapter five, verse fourteen through sixteen. One more on the menorah, anyway. Oh, I missed, uh, wait a minute, Gavin first. Uh, Gavin, uh, John 1, 5 through 9, if you will, sir. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that the light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that giveth light to every man was coming into the world. And you have a great reading voice. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, thank you. So, so now who is the light that's coming into the world? 
That's right. Jesus, yeah. And so we've already we've already seen this. Jesus is the light of the world now. And Jesus said in John 8, 12, as Jenny read, I am the light of the world, right? But now get ready for this. John chapter 5, 14 through 16. Uh, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right, so who is the light of the world? Uh -huh. Yeah, there's two answers, right? There's Jesus is the light of the world. He's the true light. But Christians are called to be the light of the world too. Now, how can that be? What do you think? Yeah, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, when you are when you are born again, when you are when you are converted, you are united to Christ, and you are made part of His body. And so, the way that the gospel shines, the way that Christ shines today, um, is through believers. It is through the body of Christ. So that's how Christ is the true light of the world. But we are called the light of the world as well. That's that's a pretty high honor, wouldn't you say, to share a title with Jesus? And we would, of course, distinguish, right? We would, we would, of course, make the distinction that he is the real light, that we have no light apart from him. But still, it is, it is a high uh, honor to, to be the light of the world. All right. Is that because of the Holy Spirit in us? Yes. Yep. That's right. And, and, you know, you can't, again, just like the Lamb has the seven eyes, you cannot separate the Trinity um, there, there are distinct persons, but they are one God. They are united. They are, they are in union, perfect union um, as one God. Okay, uh, let's see. Moving on here, just, just for a few more minutes. Um, there's, and, and listen, we're just scratching the surface on, on this stuff. I mean, we could keep going with any one of these pieces of furniture, but um, this is supposed to be an overview course, so I'm doing my best. Um, okay, so there's also the altar of incense, and someone's already mentioned the altar of incense, but the altar of incense was right in front of the veil that separates the holy place and the most holy place. Um, and Aaron was supposed to burn incense on this altar uh, every day, and the, the incense had to, it was a sweet smelling incense, and you've got references there, I'm just going to summarize what is in chapter 25, or chapter uh, 30. Um, verses 1 through 9. But basically, there is a special kind of incense that only the perfumers were allowed to make. So, you, so you, it wasn't just something that anybody could do. Only certain people were allowed to make it. Anybody who tried to duplicate it was to be put to death. Okay? So God was pretty serious about this. Um, and it was to be offered only on this, on this altar. And it was, so it was to smell good. And this is something that you see in Scripture. God likes things to, he likes smells. He likes, uh, he, he likes to participate in his creation. Um, somebody read Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. Who will read that? Let's see. Okay, Ash, uh, Asher, you read Genesis 8, 21. And then, um, let's see, Dakota, why don't you read Revelation 5, 8. Uh, who's got Genesis? Asher, you got Genesis eight twenty one. I don't see any twenty one. Okay. But, no, never mind. I didn't go far enough. Okay. And the Lord smiled the blazing aroma. The Lord said, "I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the." Intention of man's heart is evil from the youth. Neither will I ever again strike down under the living creature as I have done. Thank you. All right, so the, now this was the offering that Noah made, right, after the flood. Um, but, but that principle of God smelling the pleasing aroma. Now he's smelling the aroma of the sacrifice there. Um, here he's smelling a different kind of aroma, but it's, but it's a similar effect, okay? 
So he's, um, he's smelling a sweet aroma of incense being burned. And what spiritual truth, and you should know this by now <laughs> if you've listened to me for any amount of time, what spiritual truth do you think this is pointing to? What is it that is pleasing, and a pleasing aroma other than sacrifices to God today? Amy? Obedience. That's a great guess, but not the well, yes. first. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah, no, first. Prayers, yes. Okay, Revelation 5, 8. Who will read that? Or who, who did I call to read that? I can't remember. Dakota, yes. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Alright, so so the golden bowls full of incense, okay, that are that are depicted in John's Revelation um, are the prayers of the saints. Now who, who are the saints? That's a very important question. Who are the saints? Christians. Yeah, Christians, all Christians, not just some Christians, all Christians. All Christians biblically are holy ones. They are saints. You have been you have been set apart by Christ. You have been made holy by Christ, not by, by not by your works, but by Christ, by the grace of God. And your prayers are precious to God. They are they are symbolized by this altar of incense that is right uh, in front of the ark. The only thing dividing the prayers uh, or the incense and the ark, the presence of God, it was this was this uh, this division. Of the holy place, this this curtain of the holy place, which, by the way, is that curtain still there? No. Say say it louder, Cindy. It was ripped in two when Christ rose, right? Yes, when when Christ was crucified, it was uh, rent in two from the top to the bottom, and so so the, so the idea is that now there's no division between the prayers of the saints and the presence of the people and the most holy place. All this pointed to the spiritual truths that God showed Moses on the mountain and the truths that have been fully realized by the gospel. There, so no longer is it just the high priest that can go into the presence of God. You can go into the presence of God. Your prayers are pleasing to God. They, they are a sweet-smelling aroma to God. And, um, and, and it is Christ, our high priest, uh, who who mediates your prayers uh, to God and makes them perfectly pleasing in His sight? Andy? That makes me think of Second uh, Corinthians about uh, we are the, the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Thank you. So can can for that. Amen. Thank you for that. That is such a great. I didn't I didn't have that in my notes at all. I should have, um, but that's how the Spirit works, right? He brings things to our mind um, to complete lessons and. And, and uh, absolutely right. So Andy just pointed out that in First Corinthians or in Second Corinthians it says that we are the aroma of Christ. So it's not just um, that your prayers smell like you, right? They smell like Christ to God, and actually you smell like Christ to God. Um, and and uh, you also smell like Christ spiritually to other people. So the the same passage goes on, and it says, "To the one you smell like life, and to the other you smell like death." To the one who has lost Christianity, Christ himself smells horrible. They hate Christ. Uh, Christ is an offensive smell to the world. But to the believer, Christ is sweet and good and beautiful. He, he changes your spiritual olfactory system when you're born again. He gives you the ability to, to smell Christ as he truly is, which is lovely and beautiful, the lily of the valley, the fairest of 10,000, and so forth. All right. Anything else that, uh, that y'all would want to point out or, or question or anything as we close tonight? Isn't it awesome that God uh, laid all this out for the people? Um, and I just, I'm amazed at the way that all of this points to Christ and his people. Um, and it all was shown to Moses on the mountain. Uh, these spiritual truths were shown to him. He made the literal representations, and all of these are so that we can learn more about who God is, how He is, and ultimately what Christ has done. Yeah, we're also. Awesome. So, I mean, this just kind of hit me, but like, 
as important as the art was and all that stuff, why did it just drop off and it's just never mentioned ever again? Um, well, <clears throat> no one knows what happened uh, with the ark. Um, you know, it 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 was um, you know, it's a long it's a, it's a fairly long discussion. I guess the, I guess the um, the short answer is that God told the people that if they walked in disobedience to Him, then He would turn against them and He would scatter them and they would lose all the all the blessings of fellowship with him and they did and so he did so he actually allowed all the temple furnishings to be demolished and carried away and melted down and refashioned into something else um, the ark was where you know God met with his people but destroying the ark obviously doesn't destroy God or his ability to, to interact with people but, it, but the short answer is their sin he allowed it because of their sin Gigi? Wasn't the high priest the only one who could go in? That's right. So the people couldn't go in. That's right. So when the curtain was torn, there was no need for the ark. That's right. Yep. Did you have something out loud? I just had something. Okay. I like that ornery, um, it's called the only the finest materials of any kind were used to build the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, now the tabernacle was the precursor to the temple, of course, right? And so the temple was a stationary sanctuary. The, ta the tabernacle was a movable sanctuary. And the temple, tabernacle and temple, ultimately point towards, as a whole, point towards what? The church. Yeah, the church. So you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, it says, speaking collectively of the church, okay? Okay. Um, your body is called a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the the idea that your body is a temple is that you should not commit immorality with your with your body, right? But the church is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. What I do? She's going to tell me later. I did something. I don't know what it is. Okay. So so uh, so. Um, she she does this sometimes. She like she cracks up, and I'm like, what did I just say? Did I just like. What, what, huh? Oh, okay. So, so, but but the church itself is, is a temp, is called the temple uh, of the Holy Spirit, and uh, and you are part of that temple. So Christ is building you up as a spiritual temple, as Walt pointed out earlier. Christ is a cornerstone. You are living stones being built as a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So all of this is pointing towards the gospel and towards how we can fellowship with God, and it's just beautiful. So, all right, all right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you revealed yourself to a sinful people uh, long ago on Mount Sinai. Uh, we thank you that you gave them the law. Thank you, Lord, that you showed them uh, these directions, that you showed Moses how to, how to build the tabernacle, um, not in not just in such a way that it was beautiful, but in such a way that it was true and that it pointed towards Christ and towards his people and what he would do and how we could fellowship with you. We thank you that now, Lord, uh, Jesus is the light of the world and we are the light of the world uh, and that we are able to offer up spiritual sacrifices uh, to God, to you through Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you that Christ is the final sacrifice and Christ is our high priest but that we are priests as well and that we can enter into your presence uh, no longer being divided by the veil that separated the most holy place, but coming boldly before the throne of grace. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you receive our prayers as incense, that uh, even imperfect prayers uh, are received by you uh, and, and that we can offer that up to you, Lord. What a privilege it is to pray to you. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us and teach us and make us thankful for all that you've done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen.